Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us again. And we're delighted also to welcome Jonas and Dustin on this fourth of our demystifying sessions in February. Hi guys. Hi guys. I was and muted. Hi everyone. <laughs> it wouldn't hey be a proper show if you had forgotten to unmute. I only just did it. So the um, I'm Simon Walker. I'm head of training and learning at Maxon. And um, thank you for the lovely comments that you got coming in already. And we really appreciate that be, uh, because we um, are responding to your questions and your enthusiasm for using the tools. And that's really the driving force for all these sessions. And just talking about sessions and talking about topics, we've just on the screen at the moment, this is the events page that you can navigate to. Just go to maxon.net and hit events under the news heading. And then you can see all the sessions that we got coming up. So we'll talk more about this in a second when Jonas runs you through some of his MoGraph techniques that we based on the Christmas messaging or the holiday message that we put out towards the end of last year as we've been investigating this process. And uh, we'll also have some of the comments that um, also are useful from Dustin based on his session last week. By the way, you got some great comments on your session last week, Dustin. So thank you for sharing your workflow for that. And we've got even more coming up. So if you wanted to jump into Redshift a bit more, Ellie's got her fourth workshop on the intro to Redshift this Wednesday. And also you'll see next, we're just a little bit down the page, you'll see that uh, we're piggybacking from that. And Ellie's inviting Dustin back and Lionel back to dive into Redshift a little deeper. And as it says here, raise your Redshift games at all sorts of things, including um, particles and subsurface scattering and how to set up renders and get more out of Redshift. So please feel free to join us for that. Um, greetings to Newcastle from Jay. Uh, hi, Kent, thanks for checking the everything's working and sounding all right. Hi, Hannah, greetings to Hamburg. Hi, Anders. So we got lots of regular viewers here, so thanks for joining us again. And also just keep looking through these little sections that we've got coming up where we're extending what we've already built on. And so Jonas and Noseman will be back um, next Thursday, so Thursday week to continue the journey for um, effectors in this case on Ask the Trainer. And this Thursday we have Max carrying on with his Max on Color series where it's um, a, a, a series where we dive into color correction in a variety of tools, including the Maxon tools, but also including a number of the hosts as well as in Resolve and supporting hosts too for the Red Giant plugins. But also what the whole point of these things is to delve into the color science. And so he's got some great guests. We got some fantastic skills on the training team at Maxon and we've got lined up Chad, and also Dr. Sassy are gonna help us increase our color science knowledge, but also we're going to be inviting, or rather Max is gonna be inviting industry colleagues to come and talk about their workflows too. So this is a response to the amount of requests we had to jump into this and talk more about a balance of the creativity and the science behind doing color correction and grading. So please join us for those. And of course, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you want to see anything that you've missed, just go to Maxon Training Team on YouTube, and that's where we put the recordings of almost everything that we do on these live sessions. And then you can see some of the ones that got coming up, so just set a reminder for those. Here's the one for Maxon Thursday, and then also Jonas and Nosewin's one on effectors on Thursday week. And also, at this, the important thing about this is that we tie these into the sorts of topics that you can then get certified for. So we've got a range of certifications, starting with a free knowledge test, so that you can then gear up and plan how you might become certified, or at least test your knowledge across all the different Maxon tools. So that, that's something to look at as well, and you can find that under the Learn button on the Maxon site. And finally, just to say thank you again, we've got our Ask the Trainer exclusive free T-shirt offer, so thank you for joining us. And to get that T-shirt, you have to put in a special secret link, and that's on the PDF document, which is here, but you can also grab this document from the handout section inside the GoToWebinar interface, and we'll post it on the chat and also an answer to some of the questions so you can see this again. The trick is that you go to this particular address and then you put in this password. So for February, it's O2 Beautiful Stuff.
and the idea is that we can give you a free t-shirt you just have to pay shipping which is three or four euros or dollars but then at least you can wear one of our t-shirts with pride so we really appreciate that um, and it's just a really a little thank you for joining us on these sessions fantastic great um, and thanks for the kind comments as well and thanks Bernd for that as well we, we appreciate your feedback if you've got any further questions just jump them into the chat section or even email us training at maxon.net and then we'll look at those we read every single email that comes in and that helps as i said form the basis of lots of these sessions great i think that's the fastest i've done the intro because i didn't want to use up too much time because you've got some amazing stuff to show you Anis. what are you going to be showing today well today um I'm going to be showing the, well, one of the shots that is, that you can see just for a few seconds, like for three or four seconds. Um, and it's part of um, of this uh, diagonal um, transition. Um, it's a shot created by Tendril. And um, yeah, I want to break this down a little bit and um, show you how you can recreate it. Um, I don't know if they did it the same way um but i'm gonna do my best to recreate um yeah the look and feel of it and the excellent. animation excellent fantastic cool i should show throw the screen at you in that case and make you a presenter yes here we go So yeah, here we go. You should now see my screen and it's the one with uh, YouTube on it and with the Game Boy. Um, and um, what we see here is the Maxon Holiday greeting. And um, I'm gonna hit play and now you see this transition. And this is the shot that I'm going to recreate. So you can see it for, well, maybe less than two seconds even. And that's why I also brought it up here. So you can see it a little bit slower. So I'm going to scrub through this. We have this whatever shape that is turning into an X and those circles around it. And I'm pretty sure that the original one um, involved some sort of simulation and so on, but uh, I'm gonna try recreating this without any simulation so it's fully controllable. And um, yeah, let's see how far we get. Sounds okay, good. so let me jump into Cinema 4D and we will start from scratch. So what I wanna show you first is how we can, well, let me also jump back to this one, how we can create this transition from like, this shape or I will start at a circle to the X so that it's looking interesting and then we're going to do pretty much the same with those rings that you see here those golden rings so let's start with an object and well I'm going to go to top view first and I'm going to create a circle and I'm going to make it like 50 centimeters in radius. And one of the important things here is in order to get like a full circle, like a, a really smooth circle later, uh, I'm gonna increase the number of intermediate points to let's say 100 and immediately you can see that it's now a little bit rounder here. All right, so this is our starting shape. Now, the next thing I want to create is the X. So I'm gonna start with a rectangle. You cannot see it right now because it's too big. And I'm gonna bring the size down to let's say 25 and here, let's try 200 cent, maybe a little bit less than 200 centimeters. Let's go with 190, I think. I think that's good. <clears throat> and then I'm going to create a copy of this rectangle and rotate it by 90 degrees. And what I'm gonna do next, well, let me let me double check the width. I think it's it's a little bit too too thin. So let's go with 40. 40 is looking great. And now I want to make these two rectangles one shape. 
And I can do that with both rectangles selected. And then I go to spline, pool commands, spline union. And once I do that, you can see that I have this one um, object. That's what's supposed to be the X in the end. <clears throat> and I've got the circle. All right, now let me jump to points mode. And I want to select all of the points here simply by hitting uh, Control A. And then I'm going to right click and chamfer the whole uh, thing, all of the corners here. And I'm going to do something like 11 and a half centimeters or so. And that's fine. Cool. So now we've got these two shapes we've got the starting shape and the end shape. And one of the interesting things here is that we want to create a post morph tag to create the transition. But let me show you one thing. So if I make the circle editable, you can see that the circle has got four points only. And the X has got uh, 24 points. So it cannot be morphed simply. So let me quickly show you um, what will happen. So if I create a post morph tag, I will explain everything in a second. But let me just show you that um, this is going to be problematic. And you can see that already. So we've got the circle. And once we morph that circle into the X shape, you can see that it's just the first four points of the X shape that is going to be uh, that are going to be used for this, and that's a bad thing. So we need matching point count, and the other thing that we need is um, we need um, the splines to start. Well, let, let's say at the at the same point when you see like the full the full circle, so to speak. Um, so let me get rid of that pose morph tag, and let's. Oops, let's create this. All right, so one thing that is pretty handy inside of Cinema 4D is um, when you want to um, create splines with matching point counts, the easiest way to do that is by using a most spline object. So what you can do is you create a most spline, and in this case, that's gonna be the most spline for X, and I'm gonna set the mode to spline, and under spline up here, I'm going to throw in the original X. Now you can see that it's already a most spline, but then we are also going to adjust the generation mode to even because this mode allows us to define a point count. And I'm going to bring this up quite high because you can see that we have um, like uh, corners in here. We don't want that. We want um, this to be as smooth as possible. So I bring this up to let's say 600. And now you can see that it's pretty round. <clears throat> All right, that's looking good. And then I'm going to create a copy of this one and rename it to circle. And just replace the source spline with the circle. And now we've got two splines here, two most splines um, that are based on the two splines that. I had in the scene before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select both of them and make them editable and delete the previous two. And what we can see now is um, in points mode that these are pretty dense. Also, the circle is pretty dense. And the good thing is that they are that they both have matching point counts now. So the second thing that I mentioned earlier is that the spline start and end have to be well at the same um, part of the spline let's put it like that so in this case um, the start and end point is here so you can see that by the colorization of the spline line so it's white here that's the start and it's blue here that's the end and on the x you can see that it's not here it's somewhere else. Let's find it. It's here. So we need to adjust the spline so that the starting point is here. 
how can we do that? Well, we can simply select this point and then we right click and go down to point order, set first point. And now you can see if we select both of these splines that, that we have the white line beginning here and going upwards, same here, and the blue is coming from the bottom and going until here. And that's perfect. So now these two splines are prepared so that we can morph them. Right, how can we do that? Well, we need to morph the spline points and this can be done by using the post morph tag. So let's create the post morph tag. I right click and then I go down to rigging tags, post morph. And there are many things that you can morph. You can morph uh, positions, rotations, uh, whole hierarchies and so on. But what we, or the th thing that we want to morph here are the points. So I tick points and now you can see that we get a list here with the base pose, that's the circle and we can add new poses to that. So hey, it's working hey, as follows. We do, we do have a couple questions here before you get into the <laughs> into the next part. Okay, yeah. Bring them yeah. Up. Uh, so is there is the point order always default clockwise or counterclockwise? So the orientation well, that, of the points. That actually, I don't know. That's something I would have to try. I never thought about that. Um, I I'll just do, always create splines <laughs> and and see if it um, if it works the way I want it to work or not. And if not, I'm going to reverse the spline. You switch it right, and that's that's kind of the same answer I would give if I were doing yeah. it. Maybe I'll open up a scene here and see uh, yeah. while we're doing this. Uh, the next is uh, why did you choose 600 points, and would it make sense to do it at 360 or 720? <clears throat> um, well, uh, the only goal I had is to have enough points to to have a good rounding here. So I just wanted to have enough, let's call them segments on this rounding here. That's why I chose a number that is high enough to make sure that I can have this rounding, but also that it's not too high. So it's an arbit uh, arbitrary number that I just found out by testing. Awesome. And I'm looking here. It, it does look like it's clockwise. Oh, I do see. I see Janet uh, left a note here uh, that is clockwise as well for the default. Yeah, well, in this case, it's counterclockwise, see. correct? In this way, in this case, let me double check. If I open the spline, what's going Oh, I have the tag already on here, so let me delete that. Oh, it doesn't make a difference. That's interesting. Let's just create a new one and find that out. So I'm going to make this editable. And if I open the spline, you can see that this segment is um, missing. So that's the starting point, the white uh, side, and the blue side is the end point. So in this case, it's counterclockwise. Um, I mean, we, we could go to, uh, through all um, of the spline primitives right now, but um, yeah, for practical reasons, I would leave that because in most of the cases, it doesn't really matter. Um, but there are a few, like the one we have at the moment, um, where it is important because we're going to morph splines and those, or spline points, and those spline points will be um, morphed by their index. So this point is going to go there, this next point is going to go there, the next one there, and so on. So if we would have one clockwise um, spline and one counterclockwise spline, then uh, the morph in the end would just reverse itself, which would lead to some unwanted um, morphing. Awesome. Okay, so let's get back to what I created. So I created the post morph tag, and I already explained that we want to um, that we want to morph points. And this is the interface that you get. We have edit mode and animate mode. And edit mode, of course, is the one that we use to create our morphs. 
and the way how it's working is um well you can you can select a few points here like so and move them here and then this relative um movement or this rel um, relative uh, change um, in position is stored in here and now if i use the strength slider i can blend between these two states it's the same technique that you use for um, for example for character animation where you can um, yeah create all of the uh, all of the mimics of a character like a smile and a frown and so on um, you can do that in here and then animate the sliders in the end and we can also use that on splines however we don't want this pose because one of the cool things about this tag is that you can also drag and drop other splines in here like the x and then this guy is coming up and it's um, not just like a dialogue that tells you do you really want to do that yes or no um, but it's asking you if you want to add this as an absolute or relative morph target and absolute means yes, relative no. So what is the difference between absolute and relative? That's an important one. So let's hit yes to create an absolute um, morph target. And also another one where we say no, which is a relative one. So you can see that there are two different icons. One is the A for absolute, and this one is the relative one. So if we watch closely, the main difference is that the absolute one is referencing the existing spline here the x spline so as soon as we delete that this morph it was the first one um doesn't work anymore it it's now a relative one but it doesn't have anything to morph to that's why nothing happens so we can delete that but the relative one that we created is storing the new shape inside of the tag and this is why we can now blend between the two states all right so that's good and we are now finished with editing our morph targets so we go to animate mode and that's important for the next step we are now in animate mode this is the one where you can activate and deactivate um, this whole thing and animate it um, we can also animate the strength and so on so this is the mode that we want to use for animating. All right, but now the thing is, in here, inside of this tag, we can only blend everything together. So all of the points in here will be blended uh, from zero to 100% from the old shape to the new shape um, with the same, yeah, with the same, um, yeah, transition ratio or um, value so it's not too too interesting to watch that what i want to add here um, is actually some fall off that we can animate that allows us to um, let's say animate these inner parts here first and then the outer parts and this can be done by using fields but we cannot do that inside of the morph tag instead what we can do is we can go to the deformers and down here there is a morph deformer and this is the one we're going to use so i'm going to make it a child of uh, the circle and then well if you had the the morph target selected it would um, edit here automatically we have to throw in the morph um, the post morph tag and now you can see that we have the targets listed here or the one target that we created and we can now blend between the two using the slider and we have our fields um, our fields tab so what we can do now <clears throat> is we can create a field and i'm going to use a box field for this and now if we scale this field you can see that we can create a much more interesting um, transition between the two so first of all it's sucking in these parts here and then you can see that it's pushing out um, the long ends of this shape. So let's keyframe this. I'm going to start here and I'm going to select keyframes. I'm going to create keyframes for all of these. Then I'm going to go to frame 60 or so. 
and see where the shape is completed here and i'm going to set another keyframes here on size x y and z and now we have this and we can fine tune this a little bit for example by going into the remapping and let's say we want to adjust the contour mode to be a curve maybe smoothen it a little bit more like so and then let's say i'm happy with this for now <clears throat> okay so that's a good start let me make the box field invisible here in the viewport and the next thing i'm gonna do is i want to add some yeah some some waves here some um yeah some curvature that that makes the impression that um there is not enough tension in here to to make these lines straight and so on and i want to add this by turning this into a most line again and then adding some randomness to the shape so let me create the most spline, put it here, and I'm going to set it to spline mode again. And I'm just going to drag and drop the circle in. <clears throat> and now you can see that it's all working. I'm going to leave it at vertex this time. So it's just going to copy the vertex points of the spline, of the initial spline, the source spline. All right. And now, Here's a cool trick. So what you can do now is you can add a plane effector. And in the plane effector, in the parameters tab, I'm going to deactivate Y or set it down to zero. And then you can use the X parameter to offset the spline to the left or to the right, um, like along the spline or to the inside and the outside. So I'm going to set this to, let's say, 10. And now we want to randomize this so that this line is the baseline and it's going outwards and inwards and so on. So let me do this by creating a field and I'm going to use a random field for that. So let me add this random field here. And now you can see that we have this shape, but everything is still inside. So nothing is going outside here. So let's select the random field and in the remapping tab, we are already in here. I'm going to reduce the minimum value to minus 100. So here we go. Now you can see that it's much closer to the original uh, spline. You can also see that it's clamped here. So it's going inside, but it's not going to be pushed outside and the place where we can change that is this little button here on the right that's the clamp uh, button and if we want to unclamp this whole uh, result of the fields list here we just hit that and now you can see that we have parts going inside and parts going outside great so what else can we do here well of course we have to animate that with um with our um box field so let me add another spherical field here and just multiply it on top so instead of setting this to max i'm going to set this to multiply and this will mask everything so i'm going to scale this down and let me go to frame zero so that it's I think frame 50, uh, size 50 should be the correct size here. And I'm gonna set a keyframe, maybe not at frame zero. We're gonna make it start growing when these um, long things are going to be pushed out. So here we go and until here. And now I'm going to bring up the size a little bit more to something like that and set another keyframe. So what we have now is this. It's also um, 
well, it's looking much more interesting than before, but we can still make it more interesting. And one thing I noticed in the original is that these waves are moving towards the inside. And we can achieve that by playing with the scale value. So if we make it bigger, it will be scaled bigger, which means that all of the um, waves are going um, to the outside. And if we make it smaller, they are going to be, um, yeah, smaller, but the center of the noise is the center of the scene here. So we're going to start with 170 or so. And I have to move that keyframe to some earlier time. And then let's say here at frame 60, I'm going to scale this not not so much. Let's scale this down to 120 and set another keyframe. And what we have now is this movement where we have a little bit of waves going on to the inside and then they are going to stop. And this is also where we want these waves to be faded out completely. And we can fade this effect out by going to the plane effector. And in the effector tab, there's a strength slider and we just keyframe that one. So let's set it up like so. And now we have our animation here. So let's um, let's save this for now. Um, so that's my X. And let's also make this invisible and just play back the animation. Yeah, okay, that's that's good for now. Cool. The next thing I want to do is I want to, um, yeah, of course, make this um, an object that we can render and something with a profile, and we need a sweep to do that. So I'm going to create a sweep and make the most blind a child of the sweep, like so. And then we need a profile, and as a profile, I want to use a flower spline. And I'm going to set this, uh, the inner radius to one, the outer radius to two, and the petals to four. So I have a spline like this. And now I'm just going to throw that into the sweep as well. And we have to adjust the plane. X, Y should be the correct thing. And there we go. Maybe, maybe it should be a little bit bigger. And now you wouldn't increase the size by using um, the outer radius or the inner radius because this is based on the most blind. So actually, we now have to adjust the most blind width to um, adjust the width of the whole thing. And then in the sweep, we can make it uh, a little bit more interesting by adjusting the end rotation to uh, 720, for example. And now let's have a look at our animation. Like so, I'm going to rotate it by 45 degrees approximately so that we have the X here. Yeah, I'm happy with that. So that's cool. I'm going to save this. And are there more questions, Dustin, for now? Otherwise, I will continue with uh, the background. Yeah, so I was going to, it was kind of at a weird moment to uh, um, ask, but the primary question right now is, uh, how would you animate more than two shapes? So maybe morphing between three shapes. Um, that's a good question. And um, well, one thing you can do is you can um, create more morph targets. Uh, because those will be listed here. And as you can see, um, in the pose morph tag, as well as in the um, in the morph deformer, you can animate the strength. And then the second thing is, uh, let me let me try that. Um, if we go here and create another one, you can see that we can have two pose morph tags. And yeah, let's just do something like 
the stuff that we did before and in the basics tab I'm going to rename this to one or two in this case it's the second one and now if I create a new morph um, deformer I never tried that before to be honest um, we can use the second one here and just yeah bring that in but I just, well, I just noticed that the first deformer is overriding, that the second one is overriding the first one. So that's not possible. Uh, we have to solve that um, in a way that, um, that we animate the strength here, um, in here. But, well, if you want to mask the if the effect separately, that is then not possible. But um, if you have everything like at a weight of 100%, you can then animate those um, uh, those parameters that you set up th those um, those uh, morph targets. That's actually also a pretty common technique that you um, create something like um, th that is called half shapes, where you have one shape that um, is going from like the initial pose to your final pose and then you create something like a, a half shape that is mixed uh, that will be mixed um, into the whole thing uh, when the strength is at 50 percent for example then the half shape would be mixed at 100 percent and once um, you're approaching like 100 percent of weight of the primary shape um, the secondary shape or half shape would then go down to zero percent again so there are various right. ways how you can animate uh, and automate uh, this stuff and espresso is a good um is a good um uh, thing to do that like if you have those two shapes and um you um, use a range mapper um then this would allow you to define uh, a precise graph um on how you exactly want those to be mixed. Is there another question? Awesome. So I, I'm actually, I'm going through here. Uh, that was the uh, primary one that we answered some of the other questions earlier regarding splines. Uh, Charles says, wouldn't you just put the second spline into the pose morph and then animate the two sliders? Sorry, can you repeat that? Let's see here. He said, uh, Charles says, wouldn't you just animate the second spline in the pose morph or just put the second spline in the pose morph and then animate the two sliders? And that's what we had, what we had just uh, discussed. discussed yeah. Similar. yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, let's see. Would you have to use MoGraph for spline for uh, spline text for words? So I would, if you were doing words like this, I, we would just use the, the spline text. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Same. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's all the questions for now. Cool. So then let's continue. And uh, what I want to create is, well, pretty much the same as um, this one, but I have two other splines and I already prepared them. So you don't have to watch me creating these. And I was already anticipating that we're going to be running out of time. So <laughs> I pre-created those. So now I have two splines. Well, let me, first of all, uh, clean up the project here a little bit. So this is uh, the X, here we go. And these are my new splines and they have matching point counts. And you can see that we have this um, inner one like the circle one and we have this outer one. But what I want to do here is I want to adjust them in size a little bit. So this one, this one should be like a little bit smaller, like so, and the circle one, let's make it like this size. And then it's pretty much the same workflow here. I'm going to go to rigging tags, pose morph, uh, points, and then in here i'm gonna delete the post zero and just throw in my waves as a relative morph target so i hit no and now i can blend between the two 
and I'm gonna get rid of the waves um, spline because it's now also stored inside of the um, postmorph tag. And then I'm gonna set this to animate mode. And again, I'm going to create a morph deformer and now you can also see that uh, everything has been assigned automatically and now the interesting thing about this is um let me let me bring up the um the animation again that we have like multiple rings of this second one and that's the challenge here so what i can do is i can throw this into a cloner and this would create a shape like this or a clone pattern like this by default and what i want to do here is i want to set the mode to linear and then i'm going to get rid of the position y so i don't want to move them i just want to scale them so let me set this to let's say 140 by 140 by 140 maybe that's a little bit that's too much 130 by 130 by 130 that's okay and we're going to create multiple of these like seven <clears throat> and now the interesting thing is that we can create um a few fields here in the morph um, deformer and we're going to start with the box field again so once i create this box field you can see that i can now scale it and all of these clones here will be scaled or will be morphed at the same time that's not what i want and because what i want is <clears throat> i want one field to control the morph state of all of these um, rings um, but respecting their like initial um, size so what i have to do in order to do that i have to uh, move out the box here from the hierarchy and now watch what happens if i scale this up that's a moment of satisfaction for me by the way it's definitely satisfying so, to watch it's pretty cool yeah <laughs> so um yeah let's animate this i'm gonna start here, I'm gonna select uh, all sizes and let me, yeah, let me start at frame 24 or something. And then, um, yeah, just go to another frame and scale this one up like so. Okay, so now we don't only have this initial movement, but we also, have this uh, secondary movement coming from um, those other objects. Okay, so I'm quite happy with that, but not a 100%. So what I wanna do now is um, I want to mask this whole thing so that even if it's, uh, even if it's um, when it's becoming um, like morphed into the second state that uh, we have less influence here on the outer ring than on the inner ring. And I'm going to do that by selecting the morph uh, deformer again. And then I'm going to create a spherical field. And I'm going to um, move it out of the hierarchy here. And now we can set this up in the morph deformer and set the blending mode of the spherical field to multiply to mask um, the effect of the box field again and then i'm gonna uh, scale up the spherical field like so so this is this is the maximum that i want to to have here but you can already see that well we have we have some uh, some deformation here but these here are intersecting of course we can counter that by um by adjusting the cloner but another thing we could do here in the spherical field is if we go to the remapping um we can play with the inner offset and that's already doing quite the trick 
another thing we could do is we could go to the contour mode and adjust it to be quadratic and in here we can now make like a quadratic fall off like so so let's just assume we would be happy with this and i'm gonna make these two fields invisible yeah not too bad i have to adjust the timing a little bit especially the one of the box field so here we need to make this keyframe so that it's starting at let's say frame 10. yeah that's looking better maybe even earlier little bit later so yeah that's that's something um we can spend hours on like fine-tuning the timing and so on um yeah but let's assume we're happy here we just want to adjust the starting point because one thing that we see here is that even in the beginning there are these little waves here but only in this area and i want to show you how you could um, achieve something like that using the radial field so um, i also want to show you another way of um, creating this connection so i'm going to go to the fields menu and just create a radial field and then in this radial field i'm going to well first of all i'm going to throw it into the morph um, deformers fields list so that it's in here as well and right now it's set to normal that's okay for now and let's have a look at the radial field the radial field is actually a pretty powerful one because it allows you to create those radial transitions and we also have a parameter that is called iterations and if we set this to let's say two then we have two of these so let's have a look at this you can see that we have like this this sort of um, radial symmetry and then if we set it to four we are already halfway there so you can see that we have four segments here or not segments but four four parts and if we now go to the remapping we can go to contour mode curve and now if we adjust this curve let me bring this down to zero and bring it in to something like that. And let's bring this one in as well. And now create one point here in the middle and move it up. And now you can see that we are creating exactly this, um, or that we that we are morphing exactly here um, where we want it to morph so that we have this initial um, uh, yeah shape and in the morph the former i'm going to set the radial field here to um let's set it to max because then yeah that's looking great so this is always um using then the the, the maximum amount i one thing I see here is uh, something I'm not very happy with. So we have to fine tune the curve a little bit. So let's do this. Here you can see it's coming from this one. Let's, um, yeah, just get rid of this little corner. So here we go. Great. So now we have this animation. And the last thing I want to show you, well, there are two more things that I want to show you actually is um, how we can use these splines here now to um, deform a surface. Because if you have a look at this one, um, those rings here are not splines. Those rings are actually um, like displacements um, on, um, on a plane. So let me first of all create a plane and i'm going to make it a little bit bigger and i'm going to rotate it by 45 degrees like so and well maybe yeah it can be a little bit smaller and then 
I'm gonna have a look at the segments and I'm gonna bring them up to 100 by 100 and now I'm gonna throw this whole thing into a remesher because what I want to have here are little triangles, uh, very small ones. So I'm gonna add a remesh generator here and instead of um, creating quads, I'm going to create triangles. And you can see that we now are getting this sort of shape. And I'm going to bring up the mesh density to something like 2000%. Let's wait for a second until it's calculated. Here we go. And yeah, now let's just uh, make this editable and rename this background and the other stuff is our background splines group and I'm going to throw everything that we created before in here. So now we've got X, background splines and background. Great. So now we have this and I want to displace this shape or this, um, this plane by using these splines here. And the way I can do that, well, there are actually multiple ways of doing that. Um, we could use a displacer or, and that's the way I'm going to choose just to show you um, that it's also possible. I'm going to create a plane effector. And in the plane effector, I have to set up a few things. So first of all, in the deformer tab, let me set this from off to point. So now we are deforming points using a MoGraph effector. And in the parameter tab, I'm going to adjust the transform space from node, node is the every single point in this case, to effector, which uh, will use the effector axis. So instead of going to the side, it's now coming towards the camera to Y direction. And I'm gonna bring this down to, let's say, 10 or even less so that we see the cross like so and now in the fields tab what i can do is i can drag and drop the cloner with those background circles in here and we need to make sure that we import it as a spline object so let's do this and now you can see that something happened let's have a look at the cloner so by default, the distance mode is set to along. So we are creating a fall off along the spline. That's not what we want. What we want to have here is um, a fall off um, that is based on the radius. So let's do this. And here you go. Now you can already see that we have um, a deformation going on that is. Um, pretty close to what we want. And yeah, I'm also pretty happy with the radius already. The only thing I want to adjust here is the remapping. So what I want to do is in the contour mode, I'm going to set this to curve and then I'm going to extend the tangent of this one to make those waves more wavy. So as you can see here, it's a little bit, um, yeah, for my taste, it's a little bit too, um, well, how can I say that? It's it's not really a wave. So I, I want to have more of, of um, like this slowly coming into the wave and then I want this, this um, sharper top here. So um, I'm pretty happy with that and I'm going back to my parameter tab and I'm going to bring up the PY, let's say to four. You can see if we really want to make this uh, production ready, we need to um, crank up the, the count of uh, polygons uh, in the remesher before. So maybe let's, let's go down so that it's a little bit more beautiful. We can also play with the Fong angle to get rid of those artifacts like so. And now we have the shape. 
Cool. And well, the last thing I want to show you here is actually how we can um, create a Redshift material that allows us to, um, to have those tips of the waves to be golden and the rest to be um, like gray. Unless there are yeah. questions before that. We, we, do have, uh, we do have one question, uh, a bunch of oohs and ahs. That was definitely a wizard moment. <laughs> so, <Cool. laughs> that's great. Um, one question here from, uh, from Blair Scott. Um, can you link one of the spline points to a null or point on another object and then deform that will then influence the second object? So and then, and then perhaps with with espresso um, was the the last part of that there. That should be possible. That should be possible. To a null or point or not an object. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can create spline rigs and then um, play with those spline rigs. In theory, that should be possible. Yeah, and then we have the one from Russ here that just came in. Uh, could this be done with the volume measure as well? Um, yeah, I mean, um, you can have like any sort of object that is flat in this case, and then um, like create those splines and throw everything into a volume builder. And then just use um, use um, smooth filters on it. It wouldn't be the very same look because in the volume builder, I think you would lose the the, the control over the slope exactly. Yeah. But in general, it's possible. In general, it's possible. I mean, you could also like uh, throw the splines. Um, into um, like an um, what is the filter called? Into a or is it not the smooth, but the yeah the dilate and erode or close and open um, because those are there to move like the the surface in normal direction, and then these can um, be uh, masked using fields here. So that would also be possible. In some cases though, um, it's a good idea to, instead of play with the offset to create like the the um, the, the change um, in the surface along um, the normals, um, not doing that by the offset, but reducing the offset a little bit and instead going up with the iterations that um, most of the time leads to better results. Awesome. Okay, so let's jump into creating the materials or the one material here, because we're already on top of the hour, but um, I think um, the material uh, we can still create. So as always, there are multiple ways how you can create that material. <clears throat> well, first of all, I'm going to set the renderer here to Redshift. And then I'm going to create a new node material and open it up like so. And well, my first um, attempt was to do this with a vertex map. And this is absolutely possible. So you can create a vertex map onto the background um, object here. And then in the vertex map, use the very same field that you used in here. That's no problem and can be done. Um, another thing that you can do is um, you can search for the curvature node. And if we solo that one and start the IPR, and first of all, of course, we have to assign the, um, the material. You can see that we now have, um, have the very same shape, but based on the curvature of 
this um, this object. So we can increase the radius. Let's set it a little bit higher. If we go too high, it will be blurred away. Another thing we can do, um, which is something I like, um, most of the time, or many people um, I saw using um, like note based materials in general is that they don't think of um, color and anything else as data. But everything in here can be used like in a mathematical calculation. So if that's too dark, if that gray is too dark, um, you can simply um, use a multiplication node. Um, it's called mul. And let's just um, solo that one. So right now everything is black because input two is set to zero. Of course, everything that is multiplied by zero equals zero. If we set it to one, we have what we had before. And if we set it to, let's say five, it's becoming much uh, brighter and can be used as a mask for two materials. So that's the way I ended up with because it was um, a little bit easier and uh, I didn't have to create um, a vertex map. Um, so what I wanna do in here now is um, I wanna make this main material a little bit darker like so. And actually, one thing I don't like about this at the moment is that we don't have any lights in the scene. Therefore, it won't look good at all. So let's create an infinite light source like so. And let's rotate it a little bit. So I think I'm happy with that. That's looking cool. And also in the details, I'm going to increase the softness of the shadows and the light. And now you can see that we have a little bit more um, like gloss in here, but that's actually th something I don't want. So I'm gonna bring up the roughness here and you can see immediately that it's looking much better. It's always a very good moment uh, in a project when you start defining those shapes with light and so on. I really love that. So, Definitely. Uh, so the, the second material that we need is a gold material. So I'm just gonna create a copy of that material here. And for the sake of ease, I'm just going to use the gold um, preset and now, I want to blend those two materials together and I'm going to use a material blender for that. So my main material, base material, is the first one. And then I'm going to create a layer one with this material, it's the gold material, and this one is supposed to be used in here in the layer one blend color. And now you can already see that we have golden edges up here. Of course, at the moment, it's not looking very good. And this is because we don't have anything um, that can be reflected in this uh, gold material. So let's add um, a dome light. And in this dome light, I'm going to use a texture. So let's go to the asset browser and search for HDR. Scroll down and let's see, one of the studio ones should be fine. This one here. Yeah, look at this. That's good, it's just too bright. So let's go down with the intensity because the main light is still supposed to be like the, the infinite light that we created, like so. And well, that's, that's pretty much uh, the thing. Um, of course, you can, you can now fine tune it even more. For example, we need some, something to break up like these 
massive gray areas here. So what we can do about that is, for example, we can add a noise and I'm going to solo it and let's set this noise to, I think Luca is quite good for this and um, make it bigger, something like that and also adjust the colors to something like this. Oh yeah, I think I'm happy with that. Throw that into the diffuse color. And you can see that with everything that you add here, it's getting better and better. Of course, now we can also add some bump and all of that stuff, but in general, we are quite close. Let me save this and let's scrub the timeline a little bit. So yeah, although we don't have a material for for this guy yet, um, pretty good. Happy with that. Yeah, so, that's awesome. Uh, so a couple questions here. Uh, let's see, is Redshift now completely supporting C4D node-based materials? No, there, there are still yeah, some um, some things that um, that are not supported, like the um, substance, for example. And I believe, well, a few other things, um, but usually those are edge cases. Um, and since I like the workflow with the Cinema 4D node system uh, a little bit better because you can do stuff like, um, so for example, if you want to adjust um, or if you want to add a node in between here, you can uh, simply like, for example, let's add a ramp. You can simply throw that onto the existing line um, and so on. Um, yeah, I like the workflow with these nodes better. Um, I only use the other, uh, like the, the Redshift shader graph when I really need something uh, from that system. But it's getting better and better. Awesome, okay, so there are a couple questions here about some of the small uh, small things here in the project, like the overlapping of, of the primary X shape with the uh, displacement rings, if you will, that are coming off of that and asking how you would go about fixing that uh, in the gap that's in the, in the lower right corner of the X. Uh, so actually, oh, I, yeah. I can let you handle, I can let you handle that. <laughs> okay, okay. Let, let's, let's have a look at, the, well, uh, the, the thing with these rings not intersecting the X is actually something that is just happening here because I uh, created those independently uh, from each other and I just copy pasted um, the other splines in here. That's why they are not matching. Um, in my previous projects, when I tested this workflow, um, it just worked because um, I created them in a way that they were really matching each other. Right. I mean, one thing we could do here is, um, uh for example we could uh let's go to the x and da -da, where do we have it this here we go the box field that's the one that we animated um i mean we can we can make it stop around here at this size so that it's not um going too far we can also scale the whole thing down but um, in this case we need to make sure that we are in object scale mode or in object mode and then we could do something like that that's actually looking much better and about this one here that's an interesting one but i think Let's have a look. All right, so let's investigate a little bit. So it seems like seems like the spline wasn't closed. Let 
do, do, do. So where do we have it? It's this one here, close spline. That should fix it. Ta-da! Fixed. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's render this again. Yeah, now the gap is gone. Yeah. I mean, awesome. that's, that's pretty much it. Are there any more questions? Uh, let's see here. All right, Substance is not native on M1 yet, right? Uh, see, I would have to open in Rosetta any ETA not, on a fix. Not to my knowledge. I think, uh, I think they still have to release something there. But I'm not 100% sure. So that's to be confirmed by um, someone trying it out. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm not a Mac user myself, so <laughs> not exactly sure how that went. Awesome, yeah, I believe that's uh that's all the questions here. Cool, that's great. In this case, I would um, wrap up because uh, yeah. So Simon had to leave in the meantime, as I noticed. Um, yeah, whenever you want to uh, come back to one of our webinars, make sure you go to the Maxon events page. Um, if you go to the Maxon website, then under news events, this is the page where you are going to land. And here you can see all of the free webinars that we are um, um, going to do um, listed. And of course, if you, missed one of our sessions um, most of them are going to be hosted on the maxon training team youtube channel so here you can see um, like the demystifying post-production webinars like the series that we are running today also ask the trainers here and so on so yeah then the next thing i again want to talk about simon mentioned it in the beginning we also have these little um, certification tests and also a bigger one. So here you can uh, take a free um, test, um, which will take like one hour and you can assess yourself a little bit by doing this test. And there's also the Cinema 4D Basics comprehensive certification, which is um, like more like a pro certification, pro user certification. And of course, as mentioned in the beginning, um, there is a PDF in the handout section of the GoToWebinar interface here. And if you click that link and type in the coupon code, then you will come to this page and you can order one t-shirt for free. You will only have to pay for the shipping, which will be like three or four dollars, euros, um, depending on where you are. So yeah, that's it for today. And I hope you enjoyed it. Um, see you next time, everyone. Make sure you check out our other webinars. And yeah, bye, everyone. All right. Take care. Stay bye safe. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>